air in less than 30 seconds and look forward to the debate. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. My name is Chad Hartman. We are here for a congressional debate between Congressman Eric Paulson and his opponent, Dean Phillips. This is brought to you by the Twin West Chamber and the President, Shannon Full, is nice enough to join us. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. As the President of the Twin West Chamber of Commerce, on behalf of the staff and the Board of Directors, I'd like to welcome you to the third Congressional District Candidate Debate. Twin West prides itself on being focused on key business issues, and we make it a priority to provide the business community an opportunity to be heard by elected and appointed officials at the local, state, and federal levels of government. In addition to our advocacy work, we also have a robust programming around the areas of talent, attraction, and retention. We provide programming for small businesses and entrepreneurs, as well as assist with economic and community enhancement activities in public-private partnerships with our municipalities. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to thank our debate sponsors. Thanks again to our uh, media partner, WCCO Radio, uh, and Minnesota's Credit Union Network, who is making the broadcast of this debate possible. We welcome WCCO and their listeners to our debate. Thanks to the Twin West Chamber member sponsors, Excel Energy, Mille Lacs Corporate Ventures, and the Public Affairs Company. Thank you again to all of our sponsors. Your support makes this debate possible for us. We are pleased to, to welcome today's moderators, Tom Hauser and Chad Hartman. Tom Hauser is the chief political reporter and host of the At Issue Public Affairs Program for Channel 5 Eyewitness News. And Chad Hartman is the host of the Chad Hartman Show, which airs from noon to 3, Monday through Friday on 830 WCCO Radio. Thank you again. Please help me welcome our moderators and our candidates. So for those listening, Chad Hartman here. I'm going to introduce Congressman Eric Paulson, his fifth term representing this district. He's a member of the Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over health care, economic and trade policy, and is the chief tax running committee for the House of Representatives. He's also a member of the Joint Economic Committee, serves as co-chair of the House Medical Technology Caucus, and is a leader in advocating for the medical technology industry. He is co-chair of the Transatlantic Trade and Invest Partnership Caucus to promote trade with Europe and a leading advocate for combating sex trafficking. Prior to his time in public office, Eric Paulson worked as a business analyst at Target before being elected to Congress in 2008, Eric Paulson represented Minnesota for 14 years in the state legislature, where he served as House Majority Leader from 2003 to 2007. He received his BA in mathematics from St. Olaf College, resides in Eden Prairie with his wife and their four daughters. Please welcome Congressman Eric Paulson. And good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tom Hauser from 5 Eyewitness News. I will be introducing Dean Phillips. He was born to Artie and Dee Dee Pfeiffer in St. Paul, Minnesota. His dad, Artie, was killed in Vietnam when he was six months old. Dee Dee remarried Eddie Phillips, and Dean was adopted into the Phillips family when he was three. Dean Phillips served as chairman and co-owner of Talenti Gelato, America's third largest premium ice cream brand, until its sale to Unilever in December 2016. Previously, Mr. Phillips was chairman of Phillips Distilling Company, where he served for over a decade as president and CEO, representing the fifth generation of his family to manage the business established by his great-great-grandfather back in 1912. Dean recently opened Two Pennies Coffee Shops, a small business focused on taking care of its employees. 
Community service, particularly relative to children and health, is integral to Dean's life. He serves as co-chair of the J. and Rose Phillips Family Foundation and the Edward J. Phillips Family Foundation, among Minnesota's largest private philanthropies. Dean is the co-founder of the We Day Minnesota, the global youth empowerment initiative that he helped bring to Minnesota in 2013, and now engages over 150,000 students in over 550 public private and parochial schools. A sixth generation Minnesotan, Dean holds an MBA from the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Management. He is 49 years old, the father of two amazing daughters, and resides in Deep Haven, Minnesota. Dean Phillips was born to Artie and Dee Dee Pfeiffer again in St. Paul. Please welcome Dean Phillips. And now Chad will quickly go over the ground rules for this debate, and then we'll get to opening statements. Yes, uh, so we're going to try to get to as many topics as possible. We are going to conduct uh, the debate until 1.15. I want to make note of this, that as audience members, please be respectful of both candidates and the other attendees here. We are recording this debate, so we ask the audience members to silence their cell phones and refrain from any disruptive behavior to ensure a quality recording. The recording of the debate will be posted to our website. We are about to have opening statements. Once those conclude, Tom Hauser will start with the first question. The opening statements will be three minutes. Following that, the questions will begin with approximately a two-minute answer from each candidate. When, if Tom or I feel it is necessary for a follow-up or a clarification, we will do that, but let's start with our opening statement. We had a coin flip, and the one who won is the Congressman, Eric Paulson. Go ahead, Congressman. Thank you. Well, first of all, good afternoon, and I want to thank uh, Twin West President uh, Shannon Full uh, and the Vice President uh, of your policy engagement, uh, Deb McMillan, and all the Twin West members for being here today, for your advocacy for small business, and also everyone else who is in attendance. I want to thank Dean for also for running for Congress and being here. Look, the last two years have been a very eventful time for our country. That's just not a reference to politics in Washington, but the economic renaissance that we're now seeing our country go through in our economy. I continue to work to transcend the partisan divide to get things done that are very important to Minnesota and our community. Whether it's repealing the job-killing medical device tax, passing new laws to stop sex trafficking, and the opioid epidemic, which is a tragedy, or enacting once-in-a-generation tax reform, I've delivered results and gotten the job done. There's a reason that I've been very effective. I'm number one in the entire Congress for getting co-sponsors onto my bills. I'm number three in the entire Congress for getting bipartisan co-authors of those bills. Relationships matter, and working with colleagues on the other side of the aisle is the way I get those things done. On an issue that is so crucial to Minnesota employers, trade, I'm a leading voice against the President's misguided tariffs that are hurting consumers and costing industries jobs. Our economy is booming again, though, thanks to tax reform, tax reform that I helped write. And it's a game changer. It's only been nine months, and the results are very encouraging. Millions of Americans have now received pay raises, special benefits, benefits and, and better benefits. The economy grew over 4% last quarter. Jobless claims are now at their lowest levels in over 44 years. Unemployment is at its lowest in 18 years. Wage increases are now at a 10-year high. Consumer and business optimism are at near record levels. Investment is up, and companies are actually reversing course and bringing their intellectual property, their manufacturing, and their jobs back to America, creating now 1.5 million new jobs since the passage of tax reform. For the first time in history, we have more job openings than job seekers. But all of that would be put in jeopardy. If Dean Phillips was elected and gets his way, he'll repeal the tax cuts. He's called them terrible. He said they're awful. He said he was disgusted by it and it would cause a decades-long economic disaster. Dean supports Medicare for All, which would end Medicare as we know it for those who depend on Medicare. That would be also a disaster for our economy, requiring the federal government to double income taxes and put $32 trillion on our national debt. So this election is a choice. It's a choice between someone who has a record of getting things done and also between Dean Phillips, who so many times during this campaign has said one thing, 
while doing the opposite. All right, thank you, Congressman Paulson. And now, opening statement by Dean Phillips. Well, thank you, Tom and Chad, and our sponsors, and all of my fellow Twin West Chamber members. And greetings, everybody, and Congressman Paulson. Uh, my name is Dean Phillips, and as Tom said, my story began differently than many know. My father, Artie Peffer, was killed in the Vietnam War when I was six months old. My mother, Dee Dee, who is here today, was 24 and widowed. And we moved in with my great-grandparents in St. Paul for the first years of my life. Eventually, I was adopted into a family that demanded hard work and taught me that success is to be measured not by how much we collect, rather by how much we share. And I've lived on both sides of advantage. I've worked hard my entire life. Uh, my first job in high school was bussing tables at Runyon's in downtown Minneapolis. And I opened my very first business when I was 16 years old, a mobile car wash service, which I may return to if this run for Congress doesn't work out quite as planned. <laughs> From Phillips Distilling to Talenti Gelato to Penny's Coffee, I've always built businesses as a means to an end. And the end is not making as much money as possible. The end is taking as good a care of the people and communities that made it possible. And I'm proud that my daughters, who are both here today, are living those very same values. Daniela is playing a key role in expanding Penny's Coffee, and Pia is the co-founder of Pabs Packs, a nonprofit that's bringing smiles to children with chronic health challenges. And three days from now, I become an empty nester, which is a whole other conversation. Uh, I'm running for Congress because our Constitution anticipated a president like Donald Trump. But it surely did not anticipate a Congress that is so dysfunctional and so filled with career politicians who are bought and sold. The culture of cowardice and corruption in Washington has got to be confronted. And I will be the only member, the only member of Congress who refuses all money from PACs, all money from special interests, from federal lobbyists, and even money from members of Congress, who also use that money to influence votes. I am disappointed in both parties. I believe that Donald Trump is not a good president. I don't believe that Nancy Pelosi should be the next Speaker of the House of Representatives. And I don't believe Congressman Paulson represents the principles and values of our district any longer. He talks like Jim Ramstad, yet votes 98% of the time with the Donald Trump agenda. That's right, 98% of the time. He says he's bipartisan, yet he's not a member of the Bipartisan Problem Solvers Caucus, which is the first caucus that I'll join should I be so fortunate to represent you in the U.S. House. In 1997, he wrote legislation as a member of the Minnesota House that would eliminate PAC money from our elections. But today, Congressman Paulson is the sixth biggest taker of that very same special interest money in the entire U.S. House. That's right, number six out of 435 members, more than even Paul Ryan. Why don't his votes match his quotes? Because Congressman Paulson has been bought and sold by special interests, eaten up over the years by Washington's culture of corruption. But unlike Congressman Paulson, I cannot be bought, and I promise you I will not be sold. That's why I keep inviting Congressman Paulson to sign me to sign the Minnesota Way Pledge, which I have right here in my hand. It would eliminate all special interest money in politics, all PAC money, outside super PAC spending, and self-funding in our race. I'm hopeful that today, in front of all of you and WCCO listeners, he'll finally agree to sign the Minnesota Way, or at least explain why he won't. I know we can do better, everybody. The best is yet to come. Great days lie ahead, and I hope you'll join me on this mission to repair our government, address corruption, and get people talking and working together again. I'm Dean Phillips, and I would love to be your next member of Congress, and I remind you that everyone is invited. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Dean Phillips. Uh, we gave him a little leeway, we went a little over three minutes. We're going to try to keep uh, to the time limits for the answers to these uh, questions that are to come. And we will start with Congressman Paulson. You did vote in favor of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that I think both of you have referred to. Republicans said it would lead to great economic growth and jobs. Opponents said it would lead to tremendous budget deficits down the road. Please explain why you voted in favor of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, and do you favor eventually making those provisions permanent? 
Well, the short answer is absolutely we need to make those provisions permanent. One of the things we've had a problem with our tax code over the years when we haven't modernized it is we've seen jobs shipped overseas. The international reforms alone that we've passed are going to help bring more repatriation earnings and dollars back home, more manufacturing, more headquarters staying here rather than leaving Minnesota and leaving the country. So making the, the provisions permanent for both individuals and for small business and medium business is critical, and I expect that we'll do that, hopefully on a bipartisan basis, uh, when Congress returns this year. I worked hard on this. Bill Frenzel, Jim Ramstead, they talked a long time about tax reform. It hadn't happened since 1986. It took 31 years. And it was all built around growth. And we're seeing the positive results. I ran through a litany at the opening, in my opening statement. But it's really about traveling and visiting with small businesses right here in our own district, in the western suburbs. I'll go out to Laram. Laram talks about how they're buying new equipment now, a maintenance rail company, diversified plastics. They said that's just like rocket fuel, and now they're able to get more equipment because of the immediate expensing provisions. This is a key opportunity to accelerate growth. We've got higher wages. We've got more people employed. We've got more job openings than job seekers, which is a good problem to have. Now we need to backfill that to keep the economy strong. But the bottom line is this for me. Weak growth, which is what we were seeing under the last eight years, was not acceptable. Sure, people like Dean Phillips and those who are well off will do fine under those circumstances. But the rest of us, we won't do well in an economic depression. And that was only just around the corner. We've seen a resurgence of 4% economic growth, what we were told we could never achieve. So I'm really optimistic. I'm excited the direction we're going, and I think the best is yet to come. All right. Thank you, Eric Paulson. Uh, Dean Phillips, had you been in Congress at the time, how would you have voted on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? And when you do get elected, what would you do about it then? Well, as a business owner, I believe that we need tax policy that puts more money in middle American, middle class Americans' pockets because the only way to stimulate demand, as we all know as business owners, is to ensure that more people have more to spend and that we have markets overseas that are open to our products and services. Uh, so what I would have done differently, first of all, I, I would not have repealed the entire tax bill because there are parts of it that I actually like. Uh, I believe that we needed to reduce the corporate tax rate in this country to repatriate dollars from overseas and be competitive with the world. I don't think that's uh, unreasonable. But the promise of this bill was to accrue benefits to the middle class. I'm afraid that 80 percent of the benefits went to people who don't need it and corporations that frankly don't need it. I just talked to David and Eden Prairie the other day, one of many people who say the same thing. things. Their company's tax rates went way down and his tax went up under this bill. Uh, what I would do differently is ensure that middle tax, middle income tax breaks are permanent, and if anything, I would redo the bill so that we ensure that more money flows into middle class pockets. Uh, again, 80% of the benefits accrue to the top 1% of American earners. I don't think that is thoughtful. I don't think those are the principles and values of the district that I hope to represent. Furthermore, what deeply troubles me about that bill is the fact that it explodes our national debt, something that Congressman Paulson has spent the better part of his career as a politician fighting against. But $1.9 trillion in exploding our national debt, in my estimation, is not thoughtful tax policy. It does just the opposite of what I think we should do. And in 2016, Congressman Paulson, in this very, very debate, said that the single biggest threat to our national security was the exploding national debt. And that's what troubles me about this tax bill. Uh, there are parts of it that I like, but I believe the middle class in this country deserve better. And should I have the honor of representing our district in Congress, that's exactly what I will do. Can I follow up on that? Yes. Uh, well, let me, let me phrase it this way. Um, the increase in the debt from January to June was the highest we've had since 2012. When your opponent suggests this, aren't his numbers valid in that specific area? First, let me say the 80% number is invalid. That's already been debunked by fact check that 80% of the benefits don't go to corporations or those only in the higher 1%. That's actually not true. On the debt side, I would say this. It's not important that $1.5 trillion number because now we're seeing revenues come in at record levels across every state for the federal government. Sure, we need to focus on the spending side of the ledger, but that's mostly health care spending. It's the, it's the ratio of debt to GDP. That's the key number. That's the key difference. And actually, CBO shows that gets better in the future. That gets better. So if we're going to actually, we're not going to be able to spend our way into prosperity. We're not going to be able to borrow our way into prosperity. Well, we can grow our way into prosperity. And it solves other problems with the increased revenues coming in. If I, Chad and Tom, if I may just respond. Sure. Uh, I agree. Uh, we can't spend our way to prosperity. The way to prosperity is ensuring more people in this country have more money to spend. I'm afraid that that tax bill was designed to benefit states not like Minnesota, states like Texas and Florida. And that is why 12 of Congressman Paulson's 
Republican colleagues in the House of Representatives voted against that tax bill from states just like ours. States like California, New Jersey, New York that have higher local taxes. As you, anybody who takes advantage of the state and local tax deduction, of which almost half of people in the third district do to the tune of $17,000 a year, that is now capped at $10,000. That bill did not benefit people in Minnesota. Uh, it did benefit a lot of people around this country. I hope to work for the third district in Minnesota and only represent the interests of the people I represent, not the special interests uh, that curry favor in bills like the one that Congressman Paulson wrote and passed. Well, their average tax cut was two thousand dollars for a family of four. And those are middle-income folks that are it's getting not those true. dollars. Just so, absolutely not true. It's absolutely uh, true. One what? quick follow-up for so you, you want to repeal the tax cut? I didn't say that. I said I would fix it, and I intend to. Well, Nancy Pelosi wants to repeal. I assume you would. I'm not going to vote for Nancy Pelosi for the Speaker. But of I assume you would vote to repeal the tax cuts. Then I just told you I wasn't. Okay. One quick follow-up for Dean Phillips. There was explosive growth in the last quarter. Jobs numbers are way up. Are any of those things, do you think, a result of this jobs and tax cut bill? First of all, we had we had nice growth going before the tax bill. And it, yes, growth has increased since the tax bill, as you would expect, with $1.9 trillion on our national credit card uh, flowing back into this economy. I don't think that's thoughtful policy. I have my daughters in the room. I care about them. I care about grandchildren of many of you in this room. We have got to manage our fiscal house more thoughtfully than we are right now. Uh, and growth was decent beforehand, in fact, increasing. Uh, I think the timing of this bill was a little bit off, uh, and those are my perspectives. I would not repeal the whole bill. I think there was a lot in it that, frankly, uh, we should continue with. But I don't think the middle class in our country that I seek to represent got a good deal in this tax bill. Those are my values, and I think those are the values and principles of the people uh, that I visit with in our district uh, all the time. All right, let me chime in on health care, because that is obviously a huge driver of our economy and deficits. Let's let's talk uh, first to Dean Phillips. When the Affordable Care Act passed in 2010, uh, it passed on a partisan vote. Democrats had 60 votes at the time, and many Democrats across the country were largely in favor. When Republicans have pushed back, many Democrats throughout the Obama administration said, let's stay with it. But over the last two years, there has been a push for single payer a phrase that some people call Medicare for all, more government control. Why is single payer a better route than the Affordable Care Act, which passed just eight years ago, and how are we going to pay for it? If we're bringing up debt and deficit with the tax cuts, isn't it fair to do the same if we're talking about Medicare for all? Uh, well, I believe that our country should make the moral decision to ensure that every single American has affordable and accessible health care when they need it. The fact that we are the only developed nation in this entire world that chooses not to is something that troubles me. And the good news is that we can do it. We have innovative ideas. We have thoughts on both sides of the aisle that can accomplish that. But I believe everybody in this country, no matter your age, your income, your geography, or your condition, pre-existing or otherwise, should be denied care. And I'm hearing from too many people in our district that are one illness away from bankruptcy that can barely afford their health insurance costs. People are spending up to $4,000 per month on medications. I just met with a retired couple in Minnetonka the other day, retired teachers, both of them. They now have to spend $4,000 a month on memory care because one of them was diagnosed with early stage Alzheimer's. We can do better. We spend more than double that of any developed nation per capita on health care, and we must reduce costs. I chaired the board of Alina Health System. I have a sense of how we can do so. My, my task when I become a member of Congress, should I have that honor, is to fix and improve the ACA. It is broken, and we need to stabilize insurance markets, and I know how to do that. But we have got to address the costs in our system, and there are not enough people in Congress talking about that right now. And I want to do so by reforming our care delivery model. And that means providing incentives for prevention and quality and not just rewarding procedures and hospitalizations. I wish to expand Medicare as a buy-in option for Americans. All of you in this room like me who are small business owners and those of you who might be listening know how difficult it is when you run a small business to ensure that your employees have health care. I want that as an option to compete with private health insurance and also nonprofit. The best programs in the world are multi-payer programs, and I think that is the path forward. Lastly, if we want to begin to reduce the cost of care in this country, I don't believe Americans should subsidize the entire world's prescription drug pricing. And right now, Medicare doesn't negotiate it. Uh, Congressman Paulson has stood in the way of doing so. It is the easiest thing we can do to instantaneously reduce the cost of care. I know we can do better, but I want to represent people, not the special interests, that want to see the status quo maintained. 
Congressman Paulson, no one in this room believes you're for Medicare for all, so we can bypass that part of it. But do you think it makes more sense to work within the Affordable Care Act and make adjustments, or do you stand by your last vote when you voted for repeal and replace? The numbers for the Affordable Care Act have moved up. There are still many who oppose it. But in reaction to what Dean Phillips had to say, where are you? Are you still on repeal and replace or work within the framework of the Affordable Care Act? Well, first of all, let me mention that the bill we voted on that would have been an alternative to the Affordable Care Act would have lowered premiums 20 percent. And so that's the bottom line. We're talking about pocketbook issues for individuals, for families, and for small businesses who are represented here today. Those are the folks that I'm hearing from. And let's just rewind the tape a little bit. You go back to when the Affordable Care Act passed, it was if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your health provider, you can keep your provider. We were even told that every family was going to have their premiums reduced by $2,500, and guess what? None of that turned out to be true. It destroyed Minnesota's health care. It destroyed it. We didn't look at the opportunities that Minnesota was moving things in the right direction. We were one of the highest states in the country two years ago where we saw our premiums go up. Widows were contacting me saying, this is destroying my family. I have four young kids. I had pastors contacting me about how it had uh, upset their family. Uh, I had cancer patients contact me how they had lost their regimen of care and their providers for important health services that they relied on. And so I think when Dean talks about a Medicare buy-in, that's no different than expanding Medicare that is already in tough straits for the future. My, you know, my father just got out of the hospital. He's in a rehab facility right now. This is important to me. I want to make sure we are protecting and preserving Medicare, that we're not going to change it so it, it opens up and seniors are going to be hurt. That's very important to me. And this Medicare for all concept, it's really expensive. The buy-in, you'd have to tell us, you know, what's your plan? What's it going to cost? How are you going to pay for it? How does it work? Value-based health care is the direction to go. I've actually worked on helping improve Medicare. I passed the therapy caps bill, helping seniors so they get speech therapy, occupational therapy, uh, therapies that they deserve. That was a bipartisan law we just passed this year. Value-based health care, making sure our providers can take the risk or the reward for caring for patients. Health care rather than sick care. That's the direction to go. I'm authoring legislation on that now as well. Can uh, I just I, if I might respond? Let, let me just follow up real quick and then you jump in, Mr. Phillips. You raise valid points that many people have raised about Medicare for all and the costs, and I still want to hear those answers also. But on the ideas that the administration and Republicans touted out, do we know enough about those costs yet also? That's for you, Congressman. Oh, I'm sorry. Say, say it one yeah. more time. I it. You've talked about Medicare for all yep. and questions about the cost with that, which are very valid. I think a lot of people believe. But the idea is that Congress and the President touted as another option. Do we know enough about your costs so the consumers listening right now can make a decision about that? Well, the legislation that we passed just about a year ago actually had a 20 percent score for reducing premiums. And keep in mind, the Affordable Care Act, it, it, it increased access. It helped some people. The problem is it hurt more people than it helped. And Dean said, look, he said that health care should be a moral right. He's called it a moral right. But it's interesting, at the same time, he wasn't even providing it to his employees. And so I think that's real hypocritical. I have a follow-up for Dean Phillips. Medicare for all, single-payer, universal, whatever you want to call it. You talked about trying to improve the Affordable Care Act, but would you like to move in the direction of the government being much more involved in health care, and how would you pay for that? Uh, estimates are that it would cost uh, an incredible amount of money to do that. Uh, as I just said moments ago, uh, first of all, I, I believe in choices and I believe in competition. Uh, I believe the way to ensure that everybody in this country has care when they need it, which is a, it's a moral belief of mine, and frankly, it's what I hear when I talk to people in our district. Most everybody agrees that it should be a moral imperative in this country to at least try to find a way to ensure that people have health care when they need it. It's as simple as that. And premiums are reduced when costs go down. Congressman Paulson has voted, along with Republicans, 70 times to eliminate the ACA without any thoughtful replacement, a plan that has now millions more people receiving health care than before. My proposition is quite a simple one. Anybody who owns small businesses, you know, Congressman Paulson is a career politician. I don't blame him for not knowing what it's like to run a small business and try to pay people a livable wage and ensure they have thoughtful benefits. It's hard. I know that from experience, as all of you do. That's why I believe expanding Medicare is a buy-in option. By the way, buy-in means that people pay for the insurance. It is a simple, 
thoughtful, decent way to ensure that there's an option for everybody in this country to have insurance. And by expanding people who buy into Medicare, it becomes a more thoughtful plan that can negotiate pharmaceutical pricing, which Congressman Paulson has stood in the way of since he's been in Congress for 10 years. But we need to reduce costs. I know how to do that, and that's why I want to represent my district in Congress. Okay, let's move on to the issue of trade. Again, you didn't answer the question on health care. If, if you believe it's a moral right, why didn't you provide it for your employees? Uh, Congress, uh, I, I do, we do. I've, I've provided health care at the entities I've managed for thousands of people. And like all of you who are business owners in the room, you know how hard that is sometimes. At Penny's Coffee, we pay a $15 minimum wage. We have a thoughtful plan available to everybody. But you know how hard it is. And that's why I am in favor of, and that's why I'm advocating, for Medicare to buy into. Why not let people buy into a plan that works, that's easy to understand, that's available to everybody, and by so doing, allows Medicare to negotiate pharmaceutical pricing and reform our care delivery model, which has got to migrate from an incentive that provides money for procedures, not for prevention. But you it is a thoughtful solution. Congressman, I do provide a plan to employees, and I've done so for thousands of people. You make the rules, after and we live by them, and I'm the trying to do better because I have that experience. You, then you provided it for pennies. That's What's that, right. sir? After the newspapers caught you, then you provided it for pennies and pennies. Oh, Congressman, Before I am that, so unbelievable. Before that, let's, you did. Let's move on to the issue. It's just not true. I just want everybody listening and those in the room to understand. That, you know, this is why I'm running for Congress. Exactly why I'm running for Congress. Yep. Exactly. Please no, uh, exactly. no. Exactly. All right, let's let's, let's let Tom let's, jump. Let's in. move on to the issue of trade, uh, Congressman Paulson. You addressed this, I think, in your opening statement when you talked about uh, President Trump's misguided tariffs. Uh, where do you stand on that? I don't believe you've had a chance to vote on these because he's doing this by executive order. But if you had a chance, uh, what would you do about uh, the trade policy that has so far been put forward by uh, President Trump? that has helped still companies in this state, but has hurt farmers, I, I think, uh, a great deal. Well, the challenge with, uh, first of all, tariffs are taxes. And so lower is better, zero is best. And so uh, every president who's come into office has moved in the direction of advocating for trade agreements. And now we have an administration that is being more aggressive, rightfully so, on China, who has been stealing intellectual property, forced uh, technology transfers, and other behind-the-borders measures that have been hurting our companies. And, and, and the United States. However, it does not make sense to go after Canada, Mexico, the EU, our allies. We should have a united front against China. So I think a lot of these tariffs have been very misguided. And by the way, some of the tariffs that have been put on steel, for instance, or aluminum, it's actually hurting our own manufacturers. I've talked to some in Minnesota, the very blue collar jobs I think the president was intending to help, that now have projects put on hold. And so it's actually becoming a new uncertainty in the economy for new investment, for new projects coming online. And so I've been working with the trade ambassador, with the administration. We've had success in the bipartisan letters that I've led to exempt some consumer electronics that you know, Best Buy and others have talked about, to exempt medical devices, which should not be a part of trade wars or battles and fairly, tra uh, fairly traded pro products. And we've been able to exempt those products from those lists. However, now we need to make sure that tariffs don't escalate because nobody wins a trade war. Nobody. And agriculture is at the tip of the spear. It's why I invited many folks from Minnesota to come and testify about the impact that the tariff and trade policy would have on Minnesota's economy. So I'm going to continue to be a strong advocate, even if it's standing up to my own party or against the president on this. It's the right thing to do for Minnesota to make sure we keep these high-value manufacturing jobs and that we keep agriculture strong and alive and that we're exporting. Because a lot of the exports and the reason we survived the economic downturn so strong was because of the economic uh, uh, exports and high-value manufacturing and our farmers. Dean Phillips, where do you stand on the issue of tariffs? tariffs? There have even been some Democrats who have said they like the goal of bringing China to the negotiating table to try to level that $350 billion trade imbalance, I believe it is. Uh, but is the president going about it entirely the wrong way, or do you think this is a strategy that could work? Uh, I don't think we have a trade strategy right now, and that's another reason I'm running for Congress. Uh, as someone who's done business for 25 years and uh, all over the world, in fact, both as an importer and an exporter, you know, I know how our government's trade deals can affect a business. And I support free trade, but it has to be fair trade. And uh, when I was uh, working on Talenti Gelato, I went to Canada to ensure that we could open up distribution for our ice cream in Canada, put together a deal with two of the biggest retailers in Canada. 
only to find out a week later that our ice cream would cost three times more than any of the domestic brands in Canada because of tariffs. And it was dumbfounding to me because we have the North American Free Trade Agreement. And this, in my estimation, was not free trade. I know what poorly negotiated trade agreements can do to a business. It costs jobs in this country and it costs our enterprise the opportunity to sell our products. So I understand how that works. I would recommit to trade negotiations. Nobody wins in a tariff war. We are going to be losers. In fact, companies from Coca-Cola to Polaris are already increasing their prices because of the cost of imported aluminum. And one of the foremost constitutional responsibilities of the United States House of Representatives is to provide a check on the executive branch. And Congressman Paulson, two years ago at this very debate, said he would lead on trade. I'm afraid if this is leading on trade, we've got big problems. And I don't think we need a thoughts and tweets, Congressman. We need action. And that's why I'm running for Congress, to actually represent business interests that know how important trade is. It is the only way, along with enriching the middle class in this country and opening up markets and ensuring that those markets are available and accessible to us, can we all grow. That's how we create jobs. That's how everybody does better. And that's exactly how I'll represent our district, should I have the honor of serving it beginning in January. Okay, I'm going to jump in here since President Trump has come up a couple times here in the last answer. I will start with Congressman Paulson. You have mentioned bipartisan. You have mentioned working with the other side. You have obviously mentioned here differences with the president on tariffs, but you look at multiple outlets that have viewed your votes, and it's either at 97 percent or 98 percent that you voted with the president. So let's put aside the tweets. Let's put aside the rhetoric. Isn't it fair for voters to make this decision and accept that 96, 97, 98 percent of the time you did vote with your fellow Republicans and vote with President Trump? Well, here, here's the whole story, and uh, this is where Dean doesn't tell the whole story. And this is, I think, the problem with people who want to go to Washington and just rely on sound bites or gimmicks or bumper sticker slogans. So the 97% figure, let's just break it down. 70% of those bills that, that passed and were signed by the president were bipartisan, that had a bipartisan Democrat and a Republican co-author. In fact, that's the most, the highest record in 20 years. 20 years, which is pretty impressive. And by the way, of that 70 percent, Senator Klobuchar, a Democrat, voted 91 percent with the president of uh, Betty McCollum, 87 percent. As I mentioned earlier, as a legislator, if you want to get things done, you got to work across the aisle. You got to you got to work with your colleagues on both sides. I'm number three in the entire Congress for getting bipartisan co-authors of my bills. That's how I've been able to move things forward. I've worked with Amy Klobuchar on human trafficking. I've worked with Ron Wyden, a liberal Democrat on health care reform, on better care, lower cost options to improve Medicare. Those are positive directions. I work with Earl Blumenauer, a pretty liberal Democrat from Oregon in the House, on direct primary care. These were just initiatives that we just passed right at the end of July, by the way, that would help the Affordable Care Act move in a direction where we're dealing with catastrophic care of $6,000 deductibles, high deductibles, people feel like they don't even have health insurance. Those are bipartisan initiatives. It takes thoughtful, hard work. I'll continue to do that rather than just bumper sticker slogans saying you're with the president here and there. And by the way, if the president's wrong on Minnesota issues, whether it's protecting the boundary waters, I'll stand up to my own party. Whether it's immigration, signing a discharge petition so that we actually have votes on immigration policy, I've done that and I will continue to do that because that's really important for our state and for our economy. If I may, if I may respond. Well, let me, let me, can I just phrase it this way and then you can respond any way you would like. Absolutely. You have mentioned, Dean Phillips, that if elected, you would not vote with Nancy Pelosi as speaker. But she right now is viewed as one of the leaders of Democrats uh, in Washington, D.C. If you do become the next congressman in this district, will we look at similar numbers? Will you vote with Nancy Pelosi 96, 97, 98 percent of the time? Or are there specific issues that folks in the district that has voted for individuals like Jim Ramstead and Bill Frenzel who have voted with moderates often, will they know that you're someone who will not just follow the Democrats like the accusations have been against Congressman Paulson that he's only voting with Republicans? So as I said earlier, I think it's time for new leadership on both sides of the aisle. And because I want to be the most principled member of Congress, I don't take any money from any member of Congress because they use money to influence votes, including on leadership votes, as Congressman Paulson surely knows. So when I go to Congress, should I have that honor to represent all of you, I want to make decisions based on my principles and the people I represent, not at all based on who's given me money. So uh, that is uh, a principle that I think is very important. 
Uh, Congressman Paulson talks a lot about Jim Ramstad. He borrowed his colors. Uh, he worked for him. Uh, but I know Jim Ramstad, and you're no Jim Ramstad. And 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 Jim Ramstad and Jim Ramstad and Jim Ramstad during his tenure in Congress had about a 70 percent score voting with his own party. That's thoughtfulness. I revere Jim Ramstad. He was a Republican. He thoughtfully represented this district. I honor him. If Jim Ramstad was the congressman of the third district right now, I wouldn't be running for Congress. That's the kind of thoughtful leadership we need. One of the reasons Jim retired is he was appalled by the system that eats people up. And I want to do better. I want to bring us back to the Minnesota that I know is possible. Thoughtful representation like Dave Dernberger and Walter Mondale and Arne Carlson. We can do better, and I'm excited to do better. And that means not being beholden to the people, the interests, who give all that money. That's the difference between us, and I cannot wait to represent a district in a very thoughtful Andrew, way. you're out of time. Uh, Congressman, would you like a rebuttal? Well, I'm going to rebut. First of all, uh, Jim Ramstead supports me, and I'm proud <laughs> to have his support. Yeah. I, I'm I, proud to have his support. Know that's true anymore. And, and secondly, I'm in the top 10 percent of those who don't vote with you know, my, my, my party, in my, in my party. I'm in the top 10 percent. And so that's a good place to be. I don't vote 100 percent lock, stock, and barrel. I vote an independent streak of whatever is important for Minnesota. It could be on the boundary waters. It could be on immigration. It could be on trade policy. And so I will continue to do that. And so this notion that you're bought and sold is offensive when you say you're cowardice, that makes no sense at all. And so I've done the hard work. I'll continue to work across the aisle. It's why I'm a member of the Civility Caucus. And you join as a pair. I go. I go to the. I, I go to the. Uh, I've gone to the uh, problem solvers meetings. You don't have to be a formal member of the caucus to do that. And the reason I didn't formally join is because they had a rule that said if they, as a group, vote as a block, you have to turn over your voting card and vote with them, no matter how they vote as a block. I think that's wrong. I will never turn over my voting card uh, against the wishes of my independent constituents in the third district. All right, let's move on to another topic. It's uh, very important here in the state of Minnesota and across the country that we find a way to fund infrastructure, in particular transportation. Now, at the federal level, the gas tax has not been raised since 1993. It currently stands at 18.4 cents. It is not indexed for inflation, but between 93 and 2017, inflation has gone up nearly 70 percent, but the gas tax has stayed the same. Dean Phillips, if you were in Congress, would you seek to raise the federal gas tax? Uh, well, starting with infrastructure, I, I, I drive a 1960 International Harvester truck, and any of you uh, who drive around our highways or byways or roads know that we've got a major infrastructure problem uh, here in the 3rd District and all around the country. Uh, I believe infrastructure is one of the very few core responsibilities of government, and I'm tired of a Congress that has done almost nothing and continues to kick the can down the road. Uh, we need to find new sources of revenue to fund infrastructure. I'm in favor of the creation of a national infrastructure bank that would promote private uh, public cooperation on infrastructure projects. Uh, the gas tax, I think, is something perhaps from yesterday. I happen to drive an electric car, and the future in this country is electric vehicles, autonomous driving vehicles. And let's be thoughtful and plan for the future. Uh, and I believe a national infrastructure bank uh, is the way to do so. I also believe that multimodal transit is something important. Uh, that one of the great priorities of the Twin West Chamber of Congress is the uh, uh, commerce is the uh, Southwest Rail Project. Uh, Congressman Paulson has refused to take a position on it, yet every mayor, every town, and every city along the track has approved it. Republican mayors have been trying to contact Congressman Paulson to ask him to advocate for it. It hasn't happened. It's a billion dollars in federal dollars that I believe would be a job stimulus. It would be helpful to employers. It would create development along the way, and most importantly, help people get to work. Uh, Minnesota ranks 44th out of 50 states right now in the difference between what we send to Washington in federal tax dollars and what we get back. This is perhaps the one chance we have to generate a billion dollars in federal investment in our local community right here in the 3rd District. And Congressman Paulson hasn't taken a position. Uh, I would love to know if you favor it or don't favor it. We're going to get his position in just a moment, but I want an answer to the question, will you seek to raise the gas tax, you say maybe it's... I will not, I will not see. I, I want a more efficient government, and I want a more effective government. I think we are taxed a lot right now, and I think many people would agree with that. I want to be more efficient with how we spend our money. I want to find new sources of revenue, and I know we can do better. I do not want to raise taxes. I want, want to make that very clear. So you will not seek to raise I the federal gas tax? I will not seek to raise the federal gas tax. All right. Congressman Paulson. Well, I think it's important we have long-term transportation solutions that are able to fund programs that improve and maintain our roads, our bridges, our highways, and of course transit is important. The reality is that raising the gas tax is not a viable option for funding those programs. It's been changing over the years with high uh, miles, mild cars. Uh, road miles are being decreased, and so it's not a viable option. And it's a gas tax, by the way, is very regressive. 
It, it impacts small businesses and farmers and those of lesser means who are struggling to get by. Now, we are currently in the longest authorization we've had in a long time for a long-term transportation uh, proposal. I, I supported that. We need to continue to do long-term initiatives. It's the longest uh, transportation initiative we've had in over a decade, actually. We got off the move on six months, move on one year. It's a long-term plan. I would just say this, though, is that uh, Dean supports a carbon tax. So a carbon tax, you'd have to explain exactly what that means or what it would involve in terms of other sources. I do think we can be more efficient. I think the gas tax revenues have been siphoned off into going to other projects that aren't necessarily related to roads and bridges, uh, for instance. And so I'm not a fan of doing that. I'm not a fan of, uh, of the light rail of the Southwest. Now, we don't advocate for that in Congress. We don't play a role in that because the federal government, as the FTA, will make those decisions. We don't vote on projects like that that's independently scored. That project has been hung up mostly because of uh, fighting going on between the Metropolitan Council and the state. And by the way, a billion dollar project of federal dollars coming here, that doesn't take into account the state contributions that the state would have to make or the Met Council would have to make or that Hennepin County property taxes would go up and have to make in terms of operating a rail line like that. Mr. Phillips, is a carbon tax one of the things you have in mind as opposed to the gas tax to pay for infrastructure? Actually, uh, I hope we talk about climate change because it's on a lot of people's minds that I talk with all the time. And I don't support new taxes. Uh, I do support the Republican idea uh, of a carbon fee and dividend program that actually returns those dollars back to every single American taxpayer. Uh, I think it's a thoughtful notion. It's the only thing that allows the market to dictate uh, how we proceed and, most importantly, puts us on a path to save the earth, with I, which I uh, favor very, very significantly. Uh, so that, that is a bigger, very big difference, a carbon tax and a carbon fee and dividend policy. In fact, Greg Page, the former CEO of Cargill, uh, is very active in that, uh, a thoughtful person who uh, I admire greatly. And I want to find new solutions because there's a lot of work to be done and we have a Congress that simply is dysfunctional. And that's a big part of why I'm running for Congress. I love ideas from both sides of the aisle. There's no, no party has a monopoly on ideas. When you run a business and grow a business and you're an entrepreneur, you know that you've got to work together and you've got to find new ways to do things and we've got to be innovative. And that is simply the principles and the values that I hear every day and I want to bring, bring people together and do better. And we can do it. I will jump in next. I'll just remind our uh, radio audience that you are listening to a Twin West Chamber of Commerce debate for the 3rd District between Congressman Eric Paulson and Dean Phillips. My name is Chad Hartman, along with Tom Hauser, moderating the debate. The next topic we will cover is immigration. Congressman Paulson, we'll go to you first. We know there is a great divide in immigration in our country. The president certainly gained a great deal of traction during his election and still views it as a very vital issue to him. In fact, yesterday he mentioned that he believes midterms will be decided by immigration, that it will be the top issue. You share some views with the president, you differ with the president. If the president says immigration will decide the midterms, does that help or hurt you? Well, it's a well-known fact that this is an area that I've disagreed with the president on, and I've stood up to my own party. It's one of the reasons that I signed the discharge petition, which led to the breakthrough of actually having some votes on some policies, addressing DACA, family separation at the border, uh, changing the visa lottery system so it's based more on skills that our employers need rather than just family connections. That's very important because you've got an immigration system that is broken, it's harming our economy. It's locking out the next generation of innovators. Now, I'm, maybe I'm a unique Republican because I've actually authored bills on this uh, to bring in high-skilled workers, to making sure that low-skilled workers, where people are having trouble uh, in our uh, small business communities and medium-sized companies, find workers to actually be employed in certain areas. I've worked really hard to make sure that our Liberian community here in Minnesota is going to have certainty and confidence that they can stay here after being here for decades. We're talking about health care workers, small business owners. These are people who are ingrained in our community. President Bush, President Obama, who I helped convince to renew the extended status, and then President Trump extended their status to stay here. We need a long-term solution on permanency on this. And I think the natural problem that we've had in, in Congress of uh, not making progress on immigration has been the far left and the far right disagree, and that's held up progress. And so the far right only wants border security. The far left only wants citizenship under all options for everybody. And so it's one of the reasons I forged some of the compromises that we supported and voted on, making sure DACA recipients are going to be here. Those are the easiest folks to help. For all practical purposes, they're America's children. 
They know other. They know no other foreign country. They only know English as a language. They should be staying here. They work here for the most part. They go to school and higher education. They even serve in our military. And so I'll continue to work hard. And I think it's interesting that Dean would have you believe probably that he deplores some of these situations at the border. Um, and so we'll hear what he has to say. But I think there's an opportunity here to uh, make bipartisan consensus and move it forward. I'll keep working across the aisle to do it at every chance I get. Dean Phillips, let me ask you this, that whether you win or not, the president still will be the president once the next session begins. There are some Democrats who feel that you have to accept and give the president the wall, which he's campaigned for, and then try to get other trade-offs, such as DACA. Would you look at that as a viable alternative? Well, I'll begin by saying that my family came to this country on both sides of my family in the late 19th century for the same reason that many of you and your families came to this country, for opportunity uh, as a place of refuge from persecution. Uh, and we're all united in that. That is the America that I know, that I love, uh, and it's the America that I do want to get back to, uh, a compassionate America that values those that come here with dreams and simply wish for opportunity and possibility, and is a place of refuge for those who are seeking it. Uh, and uh, I, I, I've got a, a wonderful intern on our campaign named Stephanie, who's a dreamer. And to listen to her articulate how she and so many other kids in our community go to school during the day and wonder if their parents will be home at night uh, is something that's heart-wrenching and, uh, and deeply troublesome to me. The fact that we have a president who sits in the White House of the United States of America and makes the word immigrant a dirty word uh, is one of the most appalling truths in our country today, and we need to change it. And I want to bring those principles and values to a place that need a lot more of them. And the fact of the matter is, in 2013, we came as close as we ever have in recent years uh, in, in finally having comprehensive immigration reform. Uh, and I wish Congressman Paulson at that time had been a more thoughtful advocate to ensure that Speaker Boehner had brought that to the floor, because I think we could have gotten it done. We need to get it done. The dysfunction in Congress has got to be addressed. And that's why I'm running. I want to work with people who share the same values. This is not a Republican issue or a Democratic issue. This is a human issue, and it's an economic issue. It's the right thing to do by people. It's the right thing to do by our country. I want comprehensive immigration reform. I want a path to citizenship to everybody here who's working towards it. I want to extend DACA. I want a better Dreamers Act. And we can do better. I am so optimistic and so hopeful uh, to get that job done. Just, just to be precise, though. Because you laid out a lot of confidence. Oh, the border before. wall. Yeah. The border wall is, in my estimation, uh, a terrible use of money, $25 billion. For anybody who's fiscally responsible and looks at facts, I uh, would argue that that is not a good use of money. Uh, those who live closest to the wall, experts, uh, agree. That is not the way that we're going to protect our borders in, in the best way in the 21st century. We can do better. Uh, and I think we have to start by recognizing uh, value and how we can do things by collaboration. Uh, I am not in favor of the border wall. I think it's uh, almost as un-American uh, a thing as I've ever heard. 20-second follow-up for each of you on immigration. Congressman Tim Walls, who's now running for governor, has talked about uh, making Minnesota a sanctuary state for illegal immigrants. Uh, Dean Phillips, where do you stand on that? And Eric Paulson. I believe we need comprehensive immigration reform because we need more thoughtful laws and regulations that can be uh, that are that are decent, uh, that take into account all the dynamics and the context in which they exist, and and we need to we need to hold people accountable and all of our laws and regulations. Should and Minnesota I, and, give and, sanctuary? And I think I think we need to be. I think Minnesota should take the lead on the national stage, and I think we need representation in Minnesota to take the lead on national stage. So we rectify the issue. I'm not. In, I'm in favor of law enforcement. I believe laws in this country country should be followed. I think we have laws that are inappropriate, inhumane, unjust, and not principled. And we have a Congress filled with people who simply refuse to act. That's why I'm running for Congress. We need to change the laws and then hold people accountable and enforce them. And that is what I want to do because we shouldn't be talking about ways to break the law or not to break the law. We should fix the laws that are broken. Should the state of Minnesota or cities within the state Give sanctuary. I believe humanity transcends nations and people who are being persecuted and are fearful of being th thrown out of the country and when kids are at school and their parents may not be home at night, yes, humans come first in my estimation. And I think short term, I would do so because I think it is the human thing to do and that's the American thing to do. That said, I am not in favor of breaking laws. We need laws in this nation, but we need to change the laws to accommodate the truths that exist in this country. Congressman? I'm absolutely... absolutely. 
This, this is probably one difference that we have in the immigration space. While I work uh, across the aisle to make sure we get immigration reform settled and completed, I am not in favor of sanctuary cities. I'm not in favor of sanctuary states. We should be following the laws that we have. Uh, and most importantly, when you have ICE on the border, they are intercepting fentanyl. I've heard tragic stories on the opioid. Maybe we'll talk about that in a little bit from families that have been impacted. We have drugs coming across the border. We have human trafficking coming across the border. We cannot have sanctuary cities and cities. We should have not be an outlier. All right, thank you very much, uh, Congressman. Uh, we'll move on now to another question that's very important to the business people in this audience. It's workforce development. There's this notion in this nation, there has been for a long time, that everybody has to go to college, everybody has to go to a university, but there's a growing belief that maybe more young people should be directed into uh, vocational and technical schools because, as the Congressman pointed out earlier, uh, we're having trouble finding people to fill a lot of these jobs. Uh, Dean Phillips, let me start with you. What would you do to increase workforce development and maybe put young people on a path that doesn't necessarily lead to college if that's maybe not a good fit for them. I, I believe we need to make a slight cultural shift in this country and recognize that uh, uh, four years of college may not be for everybody and uh, we've got wonderful trades right now that are begging for people and uh, I've had the pleasure of touring a number of our training facilities including the IBEW facility, the, the electricians facility in our district. Uh, and I've seen world-class training facilities that are begging for people to come and learn and become tradesmen and women. Uh, and many times, six-figure jobs and, uh, and darn good jobs. And I think we need to invest more heavily and identify paths to, uh, to apprenticeships and, and better training for, for people because uh, we know how to do so. And, and that's a cultural shift. And I want to make sure that everybody who has a dream to work hard can be paid well. Uh, and I want to encourage that kind of workforce development. And I think we have a responsibility as a Minnesotans and as a country to ensure that the next generation of Americans are well trained, are well aware of the paths to uh, become successful and self sufficient. Uh, and I want to ensure that we do so. Congressman Pulse. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, a growing competitive economy is booming right now. And so the good news is you have people graduate, young people graduating from college that don't have as much of a challenge of paying off student loans. There's upward mobility. That's a good sign. But workforce development is the number one issue I hear about from employers now, wanting to make sure that we can actually fill the jobs that are open. And so it's about strengthening career and technical education. Uh, we had a provision that was actually just signed into law by the president, bipartisan support. We do need to focus more on apprenticeships in particular, and we need to allow states the flexibility, which is now going to be given, in meeting the needs of learners, of educators, and most importantly, employers. Um, you know, we need to make two-year school cool again. That's the bottom line. Um, community college, technical college, you can have a solid career that pays really well. And we need welders. We need plumbers. We need people that work in HVAC. I went to and visited a company in Bloomington uh, recently, and they were telling me they have seven openings. They have nine employees, but they have seven other openings right now of folks that could work in the H HVAC area. This is something that's not normally talked about in high school, and so they want to make sure they've got a pipeline coming up of folks that are filling these jobs. And the, and the salary can be as high as $110,000, $120,000. Uh, it's pretty amazing. And so we need to make two years school cool again. And so I'm looking for opportunities to continue to enhance what we just passed. Let's, uh, let's talk small businesses, because that is uh, very vital to this country, including here in the 3rd District. Congressman Paulson, I will start with you. The President certainly has drawn a lot of attention about changing regulations. Do you have any concern about the President in any way going too far? And if you're reelected, what would you do specifically to continue to make small businesses as possible as they can be in this district and across the country? Well, small business is the backbone of our economy. It has been for years. Uh, until we passed tax reform, we had more businesses failing than we're starting up. That's not a good track record. It had happened, been happening for years. We're back on the upswing now. I've actually focused on legislation that helps startup companies, and so the really true small businesses, the disruptors. And it doesn't have to just be in technology. It's actually in healthcare where we have an opportunity. So I think the regulatory reforms that we saw within the first year of the new administration really accelerated investment, accelerated growth, the anticipation of tax reform, keeping in mind we were always told we'd never do better than 2% growth. In fact, every year CBO scored it, it was going to get worse and worse. We just hit 4%. CBO is acknowledging now we'll do better than 3% at the end of the year. So small business is a key there, and uh, it fills the pipeline for those that are going into other areas of work and, 
in medium-sized companies or large employees and the good corporate citizens we have around here. You know, the medical device community that I work so hard uh, on the medical device tax repeal, for instance, these are not just big companies that we talk about here, the Medtronics and the Boston Scientifics of the world. We're talking about 80 to 85 percent of these companies being small, less than 50 employees. In fact, many of these companies you've never heard of. And it's usually just a doctor, an engineer, or an entrepreneur who is trying to come up with a new idea. So regulations matter. They may be at the FDA, they may be at the EPA, but regulations do matter. And we need to continue to make sure that they're streamlined and effective. But if they move in the wrong direction, for instance, like opening up the boundary waters to risky mineral exploration without scientific research, I'll stand up and say no, because that's not as important making sure we preserve one of our most pristine areas for our state and for our country. Dean Phillips, you have mentioned a couple times here that you are right now and have been a part of small businesses. After the president has made changes with regulations, taking some away, has it benefited you or do you believe the president has moved too far and is there a specific area where he went too far? Well, I, uh, I visit with people in our district, uh, business owners, small business and otherwise, uh, who first and foremost believe that we need more people in Congress who have built and established small businesses and managed them and uh, been job creators and made payroll. Uh, and I will bring that experience to Congress and I look forward to doing so. Uh, when it comes to regulation, uh, they exist for reasons. I think oftentimes they're burdensome and actually limit growth and I think that needs to be addressed. But thoughtful regulations, in fact in my family we like to say enjoying moderation. And, and, I, and I say that for a reason, and that's exactly how I look at regulation. Uh, if you own a small business, uh, it is appropriate that consumers be protected, whether it be in financial services or consumer products or, or food. But those regulations can't be so burdensome that they challenge business. When we opened Penny's Coffee, uh, my business partner, Ben Hertz, uh, we're a member of the Twin West Chamber, Ben's in the audience. Uh, I told Ben that I want to be the one that actually walks our paperwork down to the city offices and files for our permits and uh, establishes the business. And let me tell you, as you all know in the audience and listening who run small businesses, it is not an easy task. And I want to bring that voice to Washington because I've experienced it. The frustrations and the paperwork and the red tape and the lack of navigation. And imagine if you're someone who wants to establish a business but you might be a new American and don't understand how the system works, it's oftentimes impossible. I understand that and I want to try to fix it. Uh, so that's my perspective on regulation, is that there's always a thoughtful medium. Consumers need to be protected. This is not a Republican notion or a Democratic notion. This is a decent notion, and that's the perspective I will bring to Washington and, and look forward to doing so. All right, uh, Dean Phillips, we will stick with you. We're going to move to the issue of PAC money. Uh, you do not believe in moderation there. In fact, you're more of a teetotaler when it comes to, <laughs> to PAC money. <laughs> in your opening, you said you want your opponent to sign a pledge. Is the pledge somewhat disingenuous in the fact that you have great personal wealth and there are other members of Congress or candidates for Congress who have great personal wealth that they could spend on their own campaign and don't need PAC money? So given those parameters, uh, do you think it's a little unfair to insist that everybody play by the same rules when there are some people with great personal wealth who can play by a different set of rules? Well, I believe that we need a thoughtful and level playing field for everybody who wants to run for public office, whether it be at the local level, the state level, or even the federal level. I think Congressman Paulson and I agree on that. Uh, the best outcome of changes to our campaign finance system would be ones that encourage people to consider running for office, because too many people say, this isn't for me. It's mean-spirited. You have to spend half your time dialing for dollars. And in my estimation, we've, we've allowed a principled system to become a corrupt system. And money is taking over our politics, it's taking over our representatives. And I simply want to return to what I call the Minnesota way, which is a time where we did it better, differently. Uh, I really celebrated the fact that Congressman Paulson in 1997 wrote legislation as a member of the Minnesota House that would have eliminated PAC and special interest money from campaigns. I agree with that. But 20 years later, he's the sixth largest taker of that same money in the United States Congress of 435 people. So the Minnesota way simply says, let's do it that old way. Let's get rid of the PAC and special interest money. Let's have no self-funding. Let's get rid of all the outside spending, the super PACs, that as Congressman Paulson knows, some are going to help him, some are going to help me, some are going to attack him, and some are going to attack me. But it is a reprehensible way for a country of this esteem and of these principles to conduct itself. So my notion is let's do it differently, and I think the third district can be the first district in the country that does it differently in a principled way that is completely level. And that's why I've offered the Minnesota way 
to Congressman Paulson on a number of occasions to sign because there would be no self-funding. Because I think we need, this is not about money in Congress, who's got money and who doesn't. This is about people in Congress who have a diversity of backgrounds, in this case a business background. But at the end of the day, we need a level playing field, and I do agree. The time to do it is right now, and the way to do it is to eliminate all things. And that's why I propose this very thoughtful plan that I'd like to see us be the very first in this nation. And when I go to Congress, if I'm so honored, I will be the loudest voice for campaign finance reform that the U.S. Congress has ever seen. I won't get the best. Thank you. I, You're out of time. I won't get the best office, I won't get the best committee assignments, but I promise you, I will be the loudest voice and I'm going to try to build a course because we deserve better and we're going to do better. You are out of time, Congressman Paulson. Well, I would just say this, is that I don't think that's a thoughtful plan at all. I mean, uh, he mentions that I've, uh, number six, I don't know where you get that number from. I'm probably number six. OpenSecrets.org. Probably number six for having the most outside money getting spent on me from different organizations and special interest organizations. And at the same time, I mean, this is, this is where you're hypocritical. I mean, you're now accepting and taking money from three super PACs that are lobbying on your behalf. And not I haven't true. heard you say you anything about that. You know that's not that. true. And it is true. Three super PACs are spending money now on your behalf. Oh, It'll be millions of dollars. And you can't have it both ways. You can't have it both ways. So that's, that's hypocritical. It's the same exact thing, Dean. Well, if I just, I, I need Congress, to say quick, this. Quick follow up for yeah, you. Will, will, you, will you self fund if you feel the need to? If the congressman does not sign the pledge, would you self fund if you thought you need to fill a gap uh, to win this race? Well, let, let me make clear the Minnesota way, which I have right here, and if you have a pen handy, we can sign it right now, is, is very simple. There will be no outside PAC money. The same thing that Congressman Paulson challenged Terry Bonoff on this very stage in 2016, you might recall, with a piece of paper that was the People's Pledge, which would have gotten rid of all outside spending. I wholeheartedly agree. That's number two on this list. Number one is getting rid of PAC and special interest money. You wrote, uh, the Congressman Paulson wrote legislation in 1997 that would have gotten rid of it. So it looks like we're on the same page, and I agree. We shouldn't have self-funding if we're not going to have PAC and super PAC money and special interest money. But will you self-fund this, self -fund this year? And I, if you feel and Congressman Paulson, is the sixth largest taker of special interest money in the U.S. Congress, OpenSecrets.org. I hope you visit it and you can see for yourselves. As a result, I won't come into this race with an arm tied behind my back. That's why I think we should do this in a very thoughtful Minnesota way manner, which is to get rid of all the special interest money and all self-funding. I've invested $5,400 in my campaign so far. I heard the congressman on WCCO tell everybody listening that I'm self-financing my campaign. $5,400 plus about $29,000 by use of my 1960 truck, my 1983 pontoon, and the use of my office. I'd like to see us do this differently, and I'm offering them a chance to do so. Congressman Paulson, quick rebuttal. So he didn't directly answer the question. He intends to self-fund. And since day one, when you announced, you said you were going to self-fund your race. And so it's not only the $5,400, it's more, and you're spending money on your own race. So, so it's, Congressman, it's, will you sign the Minnesota way? It's very hypocritical. It's another gimmick. Oh, it's a gimmick. Another gimmick uh, is some of the other gimmicks we've mentioned. Uh, and so, no, uh, I'm not, I, I don't think we should only allow millionaires to run for office. I, I think that's wrong. You're right. I All think right. that's wrong. Hold on, everybody. I think that's wrong. Hold on, everybody. We're going to have one longer question. Then we're going to have two very quick questions. And we'll uh, have the closing statements. If we go past uh, 115, that'll be fine. I guess we'll stick around, then we'll use Tom's credit card afterwards and have some fun. Um, let's talk Congressman Keith I'd like Ellison. to sign that pledge that I don't yeah. have to self-fund anything up here. Let's talk Congressman Keith Ellison, who has been in the news for multiple reasons, including the fact he's stepping down from Congress, the fact that he is the DFL-endorsed candidate to be the next Attorney General, but he's also facing accusations of domestic violence. Dean Phillips offered this statement in light. The allegations against Congressman Ellison are deeply troubling and, if proven true, are disqualifying for anyone seeking public office. Every American must be afforded due process, and Congressman Ellison should continue to address this directly with Minnesotans. Again, that's what Dean Phillips had to say. Congressman, we were talking super PACs before. There's now a super PAC that is questioning all Democratic candidates in this state about where they stand on Keith Ellis and the accusations. Do you agree with what Dean Phillips had to say about the accusations that Keith Ellison is facing right now? I agree. These are very troubling allegations, and the, con and the statement that he made is, is accurate. The, the, no one should be running for public office if these allegations are proved to be true. Now, it took a week and a half for him to come out and make the statement, because this came out a week and a half ago. 
Um, but no, super PACs don't need to spend money on that if it's it's not an issue now. And so this will flush itself out, should be fully investigated. Keith Ellison will have to answer to this himself. Uh, Dean Phillips, he, Congressman Paulson suggests it was about 10 days or so. Is that true? And then if this was a Republican running, either an incumbent or someone running for the first time, would you have offered up the same words? The answer is absolutely yes. Uh, as I said in my statement, I take these allegations very seriously. Uh, any person, a man or woman, uh, who has the courage to bring up such allegations, knowing how life-changing that alone can be, uh, deserves to be heard and deserves to be listened to. Thank goodness we live in a country that affords due process to everybody, whether it be the President of the United States, uh, or Congressman Ellison, or anybody else. And that's why I said, uh, if the facts prove true, that is absolutely disqualifying. Uh, in the meantime, we have a president who resides in the White House, who has been one of the most mean-spirited people that the White House has ever known, uh, who demeans women and immigrants and people of color and Muslims, uh, even Gold Star families such as my own. Uh, we have uh, Jason Lewis in the 2nd District, uh, whose radio broadcasts that have come to light lately uh, are really appalling. Uh, we have Chris Collins, who's given Congressman Paulson $1,000 uh, who was recently indicted for insider trading. We have a culture uh, that is demeaning people, a culture of corruption uh, that I very much want to address. Uh, as human beings and as Americans, uh, we can do better. Uh, and I'm very glad, though, that suddenly we have a nation that is allowing these allegations to come to light uh, and let process take place, and that's how we should do it, no matter if you're a Republican, a Democrat, or anybody else. All right, well, that is a good jumping off point to our next uh, question. Uh, Dean Phillips, I will start with you. Many Democrats uh, say they're eager to win control of the U.S. House so they can immediately begin investigating President Trump for a host of perceived misdeeds, and including looking at impeachment. If you were elected to Congress, would you seek the impeachment of President Trump based on what you know now? Should I have the honor of serving in Congress, I will first and foremost let the Mueller investigation conclude. It's the most important thing we can do. I don't want to pass judgment on anybody without facts, especially in a day and age where discerning fact and truth is awfully complicated. Uh, should the Mueller investigation conclude and facts are presented that the President of the United States knowingly broke the law, uh, then I absolutely I would consider that. My concern is that we have a Congress right now that has a constitutional responsibility to provide a check and balance on the executive branch. In my estimation, that's not happening. That's why we need, that's why George Will, the Republican commentator, said that it is time that even Republicans vote for Democrats to flip the House to ensure that at least that check exists, because I'm afraid that if the control remains in the Republican hands, even in light of facts that are presented that criminal activity occurred and the President knew, it will not happen. But I will tell you this, uh, impeachment is a very slippery slope that we should take very seriously and has very grave and significant consequences. Uh, that's why truth has got to be established, facts have got to be presented, and we need a U.S. Congress that fulfills its responsibility to provide a check on the White House, whether it's a Democratic White House or a Republican White House. Congressman Paulson, has the Republican-controlled House been enough of a check on the President? There, we are a co-equal branch of government. We should be doing our own investigations into various issues that any administration, Republican or Democrat, would be a part of. I have been an advocate to make sure the Mueller investigation is brought through to its full conclusion. When the FBI director was fired, to me that was a signal as neutral law enforcement. It was time to make sure we had an independent counsel. I was one of the first to call for that on the Republican side of the aisle. We need to make sure that those facts are found from that investigation that goes through its conclusion, uh, and that's critical. And I remember there were members of my own party a few years ago. They, they used impeachment or wanted to use impeachment to go after the IRS commissioner, who had serious issues but didn't, in my view, rise to the level of impeachment. It's something that is very serious. The facts need to be found if there are violations of the law. I would hope that anyone in Congress would look at those facts and vote accordingly if there were violations of the law, regardless of who the president is or at that time. So our final question before we get to closing statements, and I'll start with Congressman Paulson. You have faced, sir, some criticism that as of today, this is the only scheduled debate. And while we've enjoyed this, I think a lot of voters would like to see multiple debates coming up. Can you make the commitment to the folks here and the folks listening on WCC radio that this will be the first of multiple debates 
And would you like to confirm any dates for us right here? <laughs> well, first of all, um, and thanks to WCCO for hosting us. So this is actually the very first congressional debate in the state of Minnesota. Um, and Twin West has done a great job of always doing this on a biannual basis. It always occurs. And so I'm glad they didn't hold off. Um, Dean, your campaign wanted to wait until October to do this debate. So we thought it was important to Gorley. So I'm fully supportive. It's true. It, oh, and Twin wow. West went chamber will confirm it. it so I'm absolutely, we issued a statement this morning, we will do as many debates as possible, and they need to be done where we can have both of our folks in the room. So we both have to answer the hard questions. Um, so no problem there, and I expect we will have more debates. Uh, in fact, I think in the last couple of races, it's important. Dean Phillips, you have a number in mind which is reasonable for the parties to continue to campaign. And do you have any dates in mind where you would like to offer up the opportunity for the congressman to confirm something right now? Chad, I will clear my calendar to appear in any public forum that's free and accessible, that allows Democrats, Republicans, Libertarians, Independents, anybody who wants. Come out. Have a, that's, you know, I, you know, I will say that, that this journey running for Congress has been the most joyful experience of my entire life. And it's because I get to meet with people throughout the district from every kind of background you could possibly imagine. And I learn more from people who disagree with me than people who agree with me. And that's why I've had more open public forums in the last week than Congressman Paulson has had in the last seven years. And, and I say that not in jest. I, so Chad, the, the, the answer to your question is I will do as many as possible because I believe the foremost responsibility of anybody running for Congress, whether you are a current congressperson or seeking the office, should be to appear in front of the people that ultimately are the voters as many times as possible. And they should be free, they should be accessible, they should be open to anybody from any party, and most of all, they shouldn't be curated and managed. Anybody who has a question should come and be able to ask it of both of us. And boy, I would love to do nothing more, and I hope we have that chance anytime. Okay, we have come to the end of the debate. It's time now for three-minute closing statements by each of the candidates, and we will begin with Congressman Paulson. I went first last time, I think. We will begin with Dean Phillips. Oh, I, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'll, I don't care. Well, I, I want to thank I want to thank our moderators. Uh, I'm so glad Chad and Tom conducted themselves in a very thoughtful manner today. Uh, I want to thank our hosts, and, and I do. I want to thank Congressman Paulson. I, I want more people to aspire to serve our country and our state and our communities, uh, and I do thank you. And I want to thank all of you who are here today and all of you listening, uh, because no matter who you vote for in this next election, which I think will be one of the most consequential in our nation's history, it's your participation that ensures that our collective future is bright. I believe that representation begins with listening, and that's why I've been driving from Bloomington to Brooklyn Park and everywhere in between, having conversations with thousands of people of all backgrounds, beliefs, and political perspectives. And I've learned there's a lot more that unites us than divides us. In fact, most of us agree that it is time for our nation to make the moral decision to ensure that everybody has access to affordable health care when they need it. To ensure that every American child receives a world-class public education and that their teachers the support and resources they need. To believe in science and acknowledge that the threat of climate change is real and lead the migration to a renewable energy economy that can create millions of jobs for Americans. To enhance uh, economic security for retirees and women and ensure equal pay for equal work and preserve women's reproductive rights. To acknowledge, to acknowledge that thoughts and tweets don't save lives. Action saves lives. And we need, this country needs thoughtful, sensible gun violence reduction policies in place immediately. And no matter what your number one issue is, and they are all important, I ask that your number two issue be money and politics. Because nothing important to anybody on this stage, in this room, listening, or in this country, nothing that is important to you will ever get accomplished if we do not reduce the influence of affluence in our political system. Now many of you, in fact most of you, paid $60 to be here today, which is the least amount you'll probably ever have to pay to be in front of Congressman Paulson. <laughs> I'm a different kind. I'm a different kind of candidate. I'm one who refuses all money from PACs, all money from special interests, all money from federal lobbyists. 
and all money from members of Congress so that I'm only accountable to the voters of Minnesota's third district. That's why I'm disappointed that Congressman Paulson once again refuses to sign the simple Minnesota Way pledge. Quite simply, a vote for Congressman Paulson is a vote for the status quo in Congress. Dysfunction, chaos, and a growing culture of corruption. If you want more of that, Congressman Paulson is your guy. But if you believe that we can do better and want fiscally responsible, socially inclusive, and independent-minded leadership, I would be so honored to be your next representative in Congress. And I approach public policy the same way I've helped build businesses, by soliciting ideas from everybody, by being innovative, collaborative, and always finding a way to do more with less. And that's why over 50,000 Democrats, independents, Republicans, and fellow business owners have invested in my campaign to bring courage to Congress. Now, my campaign is about bringing people together. So after the debate, I invite every one of you to join me at Cooper's across the street for some food and conversation. Tonight, I'll be in Eden Prairie at the City Center for a free public voter forum to which all of you are invited. And Congressman Paulson, I've extended the invitation to you. I hope you will come. And I ask you that you mark your calendars for September 15th. We're going to be holding a massive family picnic in Excelsior to which everyone's invited. Food, conversation, music, games, and a good dose of fun and hopefulness. And last but not least, I'm Dean Phillips. And I'm energized, I'm optimistic, and I know we can do better. I believe our best days are yet to come. And we all must work together to get there and start working together again. I would be so honored to earn your vote. Change is coming, my friends, and everyone is invited. Thank you so much. And Congressman Paulson, he went a little long, so you can have a little additional time yourself. I'd just like to give away WCCO's airtime, so you just... Let me just start by also thanking both Tom and Chad for hosting today and the, for the Twin West Chamber for hosting this, uh, for the debate today. Look, these are very challenging times, as I said uh, at the outset, in both our country and in politics. Two years ago, two years ago, I said I would work with whoever was elected president. And when I've agreed with President Trump, I've worked with him. Tax reform, regulatory reform, our economy's booming today. On issues like immigration and trade and protecting the boundary waters, I've opposed the president. I've stood up to leaders of my own party because it was the right thing to do for Minnesota, and I'll continue to do that. I'm not only working hard to fix a broken Washington, I'm working to bring people together across the aisle to get important things done. I've got a record of doing it. I've passed really important, probably the most gratifying legislation to actually work on to stop sex trafficking working with Amy Klobuchar on initiatives that are literally saving the lives of 12 and 13 and 14 year old girls. To help our seniors, I passed a new bipartisan law that had been blocked for years and years and years that lifts the therapy caps on our seniors so they can get physical therapy, speech therapy, occupational therapy, and the services that they deserve and need in Medicare. And I've authored these initiatives that have passed with strong bipartisan support to combat the opioid epidemic, which is a tragic crisis not only in Minnesota, but across the country. I remain focused on really important issues in the Minnesota economy, eliminating the medical device tax, which is critical to protecting Minnesota innovation and the 35,000 plus jobs that we have right here. And importantly, I helped fix a broken tax code that was dragging down our economy, that was sending American jobs and headquarters and innovation overseas. Now, Dean said he, wouldn't, he would not vote to repeal the tax bill. But back in November, he said it would be the easiest vote to vote no. What's, what's different now? The audience? The truth is, I get a lot of ideas from listening to people like you. Being accessible, being a good listener, those were the, the ideas come from. Please be respectful. Please. Interacting with the people I represent is the way to make progress on important issues on a bipartisan basis. So this election is really about a choice of someone having a record of getting things done or someone like my opponent who is now telling you a lot of things you'd like to hear. So I do ask for your support in November and the privilege of continuing to represent you. I thank you very much. We'll wrap it up here, uh, Chad Hartman and Tom Hauser. Thank you very much for being a part of this. Most importantly, thank you to Congressman Paulson and Dean Phillips for participating, Twin West Chamber for putting this together, the Minnesota Credit Union Network, and the Twin West Chamber's media sponsors, XL Energy, Relax Corporate Ventures, and the Public Affairs Company. I think both are right that these days are very important. Let's hope these are the first of many debates that we get a chance to listen to 
Thank you very much for showing up. And for the folks on WCC Radio, we'll take a short break and can continue the show in a matter of moments. How about a final round of applause for the two participants? Oh, that's not a problem. Thank you. 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 Thank you